Good evening, everybody. <laughs> I will begin tonight by saying, while I may be a nerd, I am not a scientist in any way or form. So if there are anything involving numbers I get wrong, I apologize already. <laughs> okay? Just, just I'm starting with that to make sure that's very clear. All right, so um, uh, uh, a brief thing about me. I'm actually, and this will seem even stranger given the topic, I'm an early medievalist. That's, that's my topic. I study Old English and Anglo-Latin literature, which clearly relates to tentacle brains and sciencey things, <laughs> obviously, right? <laughs> um, so keep that in mind also as we uh, go along. And uh, what I thought I'd do tonight is something, I, I'm going to be very mean because I'm a teacher. Quiz! Yeah. All right, quiz time. Okay, I have no prizes, sadly, but you know, the kudos, and you can congratulate yourself on this. Uh, so my question is quite simple, two parts. What is this, and what does it mean to you? Okay, you ready? Okay, so first one is this. You have to listen, it's a sound, let's hope this works. Okay, take a minute. So first question, anybody can answer, what is that? Beer. Beer, beer. Can Coke being, beer. can beer being full, Coca-Cola. So we got alcoholics and somebody not alcoholic. All right, <laughs> we're doing good. Now he's alcoholic too. Oh uh, yeah, but it was, he was being good, right? I, I appreciate the attempt. Uh, so right, if you're non-alcoholic, not me, you'd say Coca-Cola, right? You know, this, if my son asked, that's what the answer is. Yes, son, it is Coca-Cola. Uh, the true answer, given the location, of course, is something more like beer. Uh, not really Sopador, it's just the only picture I could find. Uh, the beer here is much uh, better, obviously. So most of us think of these things, right? That's what it is. But the next question is, what does it mean to you? The sound it means everything. It's life. OK, what else? What does it mean to you to hear the sound of that popping being open? Refreshing. Refreshing. Yeah, Relaxing. it's hot. Sorry? Happiness. Happiness. <laughs> Relaxing. Ah, I like that. Healing sound. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Everything feels better, obviously. Uh, that's true, right? And these are our associations with that sound, right? Before you saw the image, you heard a sound, and that's what you thought of. Now, that's great. I'm glad that that is our, uh, our kind of thing. We're like this. We're having a great party, right? <laughs> We're all you know, doing a great time. But of course, that's not the only possible association with such a sound, right? We could, however, for example, have these associations. Uh, let's say we've gone to an office party. We've been there far too long, and we pass out somewhere, sometimes on the train. Now, maybe you like this. I'm going to just say most of us would not like to be like that, <laughs> right? That, that's when it gets less than fun. And for some people, I have friends like this for whom just the sound reminds them of too many moments like this. So I think you probably already see what I'm getting at. Sound is important. It carries all kinds of information and associations, some of which are great, some of which are less than great. We'll keep this going. Next one. Here we go. Ready? Give it a minute. This might be a bit harder, though. <laughs> All right. What is this? Who knows? Sorry? Choir. Choir, a choral singing. I mean, cheeky, this is Merton. <laughs> um, right, so this is a choir singing, and this is actually a picture of said choir in Merton College, Oxford. Um, and so this is a very specific kind of thing. So, next question again what does that mean to you, that sound? Old. old. <laughs> okay. Church. church. Okay, church, old. Anything else? What did it mean to you to hear choral music? 
Now I'm cheating a bit, but sorry? Uncomfortable seats. Uncomfortable <laughs> They are not comfortable. <laughs> Trust, yeah, many, many nights. No, they're not comfy. Anything else comes to mind? Praying. Sorry? Praying. Praying, right? So religion, faith. Okay, very good. So there are lots of, again, positive associations with this for those of you for whom this is the kind of thing you may have experienced, right? Faith, uh, the warmth of a church, the comfort of the ceremony being the same over and over again, the songs you've heard many times since a child. From some of you, it may mean almost nothing, right? It's like, it sounds cool, <laughs> right? Because, you know, you have no, you haven't, gone there, right? I, I'm actually from Hawaii, uh, as you can tell. And um, until I went to England, I had never stepped into some place like this, let alone heard music like this. It was something you see in movies, right? It's like, oh, it looks cool in a movie about England or something. <laughs> um, but, right, if you live and breathe that, it means something different. But also, of course, this is faith, church, the Christian church in this case, the High Anglic Anglican church, um, and there are other associations with such kinds of things. Yes, faith, beautiful places, lovely, but also things like abuse in the church, right? Many people hear this and remember not so nice times they had connected to the church. I, have, I also have friends for whom just the sound of choral music is deeply off-putting to them because they remember many uncomfortable, thankfully not like these, but many uncomfortable experiences to do with the church. So again, the sound is connected to all these different things. We're gonna keep this going now. All right, next one. So what is this? Choir. <laughs> it's a different kind of choir, sure. Sorry? Yeah. Chanting, yes. I suppose in English, the closest we could say is Buddhist chanting, right? So very good. What does this mean to you? Somebody died. Somebody died, OK. Death, temple next door, keeps you awake, fine. <laughs> yeah. it's, so like, it's like, oh, it's three in the morning. No. Anyone else? What does it mean to you? Zen. 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 Okay, Zen, Buddhism, all the things that go with Zen, good. Funeral. A funeral, right, yeah. A lot of my Japanese friends, if they but hear this. Be, I should go there, but I didn't go there. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think, when I, when I hear the church music, I should have gone, but oh, I did it. Shame on me, I was in a pub. Anyway. Um, but yeah, you're right. So a lot of my Japanese friends, they hear this, they think of funerals, right? It's very often it's the kind of place you would hear those sounds. Not always, but a lot. So we have different associations, right? We have things like, this is a great funeral for electronics, which I thought was hilarious. Um, and of course, things like even butsudan, inside a house. All the associations with Buddhism, with family, with ritual, right? You hear that, you think of these things. You grow up in Hawaii, uh, it sounds cool. That's my only association, neat, right? <laughs> so the point of course is that each of these things has specific associations depending on your experience. All right, moving on. Now we're going, so we've done lots of human stuff, hooray! But I'm actually very interested in the terribly named non-human world, which of course doesn't really exist but the things that are not us, right? So we're gonna uh, hear some non-anthropogenic sounds, and the same question applies. What is it, and what does it mean to you? Okay, so here's the first one. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> okay, this is an easy one. What is this? Cicada semi, right? Now, Again, 
What does this mean to you? You hear a semi, what's the first thing you think of? Summer. Summer. Okay, what else? Summer. Yeah, heat. Heat. Good. What else? Humid. Humid. <laughs> Anything else? Nuisance. Nuisance. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Right, so we may think of things like summer festivals, right? It's hot, it's humid, we put on yukata if we have them, we go to a festival, pretend we're having fun, have enough beer till we have fun, you know, and, and it's great. You know, we think of things like festivals, we may think of obon, right, towards the end of summer, and so we have two different associations. We have purely festive, fun stuff, we have festive, but also other things, right? Obon is a little bit of both. And so we have all these associations because we live in Japan, right? Now, for those of you who don't live in Japan, well, heat, obviously, yes, that's how I feel. So again, I grew up in Hawaii. We do not have cicadas in Hawaii, all right? My idea of a cicada sound is anime. <laughs> because every anime seems to happen in summer, right? I don't know why, but they're always in summer. It's very strange. OK, uh, next one. Okay, what is this? Thunderstorm, very good. Sorry, I'm gonna go a bit quicker so we can get through a mirror of these. I think I'm running out of time. Okay, thunderstorm, very good. What does it mean to you? Beautiful, what else? Rainy season, okay. Still summer. Still summer. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Epic holiday spot. Oh, yeah, it's very true. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, very true. <laughs> Anything else? Delayed yeah. trains and airplanes. Ah, uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, there are many things we think of. My kids go like this. Oh, no. <laughs> um, right. Uh, or we're going to jump back into the medieval past. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting towards my, my own research here. In the medieval past, in the, uh, let's call them the Vikings, to be easy, uh, they had a god named Thor, who was the god of thunder. And when there were thunderbolts, they thought he was hitting things with his hammer. Similar to, of course, here we have Raijin hitting his drums, right? Um, so that was the association they, they had. Some of us may think of floods. I have friends for whom, again, the sound of thunder is not a pleasant thing. They think of unfortunate circumstances. All right, moving right along, next one. All right, what is this one? Crows. Crows, very good. Karasu, our favorite bird. No. <laughs> All right, so it's a crow. Again, something I had never experienced, really. There are some in England, there are ravens and things, but nothing like here where they're everywhere and talking all the time. Um, some of you may have associations like this. Stealing my rubbish. I hate that. <laughs> or attacking you while you're in the park, right? These are the kinds of associations we have here. Again, in the medieval past, they had, they're called uh, the beasts of battle in uh, Old English and, and Old Norse uh, poetry. So when there was a battle happening, the ravens and the crows would start circling and crying out. So in poetry, they always talk about these things happening. The beasts of battle show up. You know someone's going to die, right? <laughs> so that's the association they would have had. All right, so we're past our little uh, fun exercise for the moment. Uh, so this leads me into my actual research, which is in, uh, presently almost done on soundscapes, particularly historical soundscapes, which sounds kind of like an oxymoron, right? Sound is fairly timely. It happens and then it stops. But thanks to work by people like um, Murray Schaefer, um, they argued quite convincingly that actually you can, in a sense, excavate historical soundscapes through research by reading what people wrote about sounds, what they thought about it, how they used them in their stories. And so um, following his book called Soundscape, The Tuning of the World, were other people like Steve Feld who coined terms like acoustomology that t thinks about how sound matters in a place, just like how we all experience tonight, right? Each of those sounds is different depending on your place, your experience. Again, something like a cicada means meant nothing to me until I lived here. Now, 
I know what they mean a lot, <laughs> all the time. Um, and we'll skip uh, there. So what I'm going to show you is how this shows up in literature first before we move on to other things. Um, so this is an old English poem called The Seafarer. And The Seafarer is really quite a lot of fun um, because it, it's essentially about a solitary person going off into the ocean and it's all cold and horrible and icy and stuff. Um, but it has a lot of great focus on sound, a lot more than most old, uh, other Old English poetry. So in red, for example, we have, there I heard nothing except the roaring sea. That's English, by the way. That's what it used to sound like. Uh, <laughs> it actually was easier back then, I'm just saying. Um, so we have the roaring sea. Then down here we have the storms beat the rocky cliffs where the ice feather turn answered them. So we have the storms making noise and the turn, a type of bird answering them. It's kind of like vocal back and forth going on there. We have eagles. We have all kinds of things singing. And this is all used because these birds and these locations had clear associations for these people. They were trying to showcase, essentially, what is the coldest, most horrible place you can think of? I got it. Ice, snow, birds, all this stuff. It's just freezing and awful. And it's, it, it's deliberately used. We can see them deliberately using these sounds to create this literary moment. <clears throat> and uh, we also have this great thing where they, they compare birds with the life in the hall with the humans. The cry of the get, so the song of the swan is my entertainment. So instead of having a person singing, you have these swans. Or the cry of the gannet and the sound of the curlew instead of the laughter of people. So instead of everyone having fun, you hear these birds singing as you sit out there frozen. Or the singing seagull instead of mead. I'd prefer mead, just saying. Uh, but the seagull, again, it's <laughs> contrasting all these things. So all I really want to say was it, with this is that um, this is an example of them using these sounds that for them had specific associations. And even though I am not, did not live in this period, and there's a lot of, you know, in a sense, research and guesswork you have to do, you can at least say that they're doing this on purpose. This is a poem. They're quoting these birds for a reason. The reason being to showcase this soul, this solitary wanderer alone on the ocean. And these are supposed to kind of build up the atmosphere a bit. Um, and another thing is the ways in which sound transmits knowledge. Again, we all think of specific things when you hear sounds. But one thing that's quite fun with birds is most bird names in many, many languages are onomatopoeic. We name them for how they sound, right? Because most of us will hear a bird, we may not see it, but we hear them, right? They're really loud, <laughs> especially crows and ravens and things like that. And so, for example, uh, the Old English word for gull is meow, which is why we still say mewing in English. That's the sound they make. Or a same thing like a curlew does a kind of hulpe sound, so they called it a hulpe <laughs> in Old English. And this is a kind of very common thing. Um, so very quickly, I'll, I'll skip most of these, but just so you get the idea. Um, for example, the cormorant, which we do have some Japanese cormorants on the way to Kyudai, if you ever want to see them, uh, was called in old, in old English a scraf. Now try to listen to its sound. Here we go. So the sound it makes is the name that it was given. And this happens a lot. Crows are from the sound. Right? In Old English, it's krawe, a bit closer to the, to the actual sound. A gull, again, is mew. Right? <laughs> um, my favorite is the stone yeller. That's what they used to call kestrels, because they tend not to make noise until they're at their nest, which is usually on a bunch of stone, and they sound like this. Just yelling at the stones, great. Uh, we can skip the rook, and the, the troll does fun. Turtur, 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 right? Turtle dove. All right. So the point of all this is to say, even in the medieval past, while I cannot hear as they did, we can see that they clearly name these things after the sounds in such a way that we can still identify them and make it makes perfect sense. Oh, obviously that's what a turtle dove sounds like, because it, you know, it, it makes it's great. Um, 
So the point of all these things is to say that sounds are important. They transmit knowledge, they transmit culture, and they are very contextual. It depends on your time, place, language, culture, faith, all of the above. And it matters. So my interest is in this, in sound and what it means and how it means what it means. Um, so the sec second part, which I think I'm going to run out of time for, uh, is um, the sort of main, uh, OK. Sorry, yeah. I should have practiced it before. OK, uh, is the main sort of part of my talk. Yeah, let's get past that nonsense. All right. Um, is I'm obsessed with the ocean. I'm from Hawaii. I spent any chance I get. I went this morning surfing. I should have been doing work. Sorry, I didn't do work. Uh, I went surfing instead. Um, but I'm obsessed with how sound also works in the ocean. Because of course, in the ocean, sound travels much further and much faster than it does on land. And this means that the majority of creatures that exist in the ocean use sound in one way or another. Even things as small as coral polyps, the little things that become corals, will use sound as a means of kind of finding where to fix themselves. So it, it's, it's a very important means of communication and uh, sort of way to get information in the ocean. We have things like whales, of course. We all know the whale songs. Woo -hoo! Sounds very nice, right? Humpback whales. Um, but of course, they can um, transmit uh, information to each other. Whales essentially have culture that they transmit. So we can track, for example, a whale will sing a song on this part of the world, and we can track how it travels to different pods all the way through the world. So we have essentially whale communication and culture via sound. Um, and of course, there's a great thing where a, lot, a bunch of different whales actually have a series of clicks that are kind of like a name. They sort of say, say hey, this is me, uh, which again is really interesting. Um, and uh, recently, for example, they're starting to use sound to uh, help coral reefs. So they discovered that coral reefs, when they're healthy, are really noisy. They make all kinds of sound, lots of shrimp and fish booming and whooping and all kinds of stuff. And when a coral reef is damaged, one way to get fish to come back and to restore the ecosystem is to quite literally play the sound of a healthy coral reef. And fish are like, oh, good, it's healthy. I'll go back to that, you know? Um, which is really weird, but it, it actually works. Um, so this all leads me to the actual creative part of this presentation, which I'll try to do very quickly, uh, which is because of these interests um, in my academic work has led me into my creative work. Um, I, I've written a novel, um, but I've most recently created a very short video game uh, based on the question of the experience of sound and the world through the sensory apparatus of not humans. Because of course, I like how I experience the world, but it's a very narrow vision of what exists, right? We, we have a lot of great sensory organs, but they're not that great in lots of other ways. And I thought, what better thing to explore this than something incredibly different from us? And so I picked an octopus. Octopus are weird. They're like soup, uh, they're tasty, but they're also super weird. Um, so you may or may not know this, you probably do that an octopus is very smart. They're notorious for, uh, for example, breaking out of their enclosures in aquariums. There's a great story about one that the, the keeper gave him the wrong food. The thing got out, took the food, and threw it at its face, and just went back to its cage and just sort of sat there. Like, come on, man, where's my food? Um, so they, they have about as many neurons as a dog, about 500 million neurons, but two-thirds of them are not in their central brain. Two-thirds of the neurons are spread out into their eight arms. This means that they have a distributed intelligence. So if you can try and imagine that you have a central brain that sort of says to do stuff, but at the same time your hand's kind of just finding stuff on it. It's like, oh, it's pretty tasty. Here, have some. Oh, yeah, have some of this over here. Ah, oh, right? <laughs> it's weird. Um, but it's interesting because it's a very different way of interacting with the world. In some ways, it's a very communal way of acting with the world. You're not an individual in the same sense a mammal like us is. We have a single brain. Our limbs do what we say, mostly, right? And so I found this really interesting. So I wanted to explore this in a creative way, and so I made this game called Knowing Oceans, which explores what it would be like to do this. Uh, so we can skip this a little bit. And uh, so the story is, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, you, the player, follows subject 125, who was a Hawaiian graduate student in Japan in the 1980s. 
as she takes part in an experiment. She's not told what it is. She's only told she gets funding if she does it. And if you're a student, you know this matters, right? <laughs> funding, I'll do it, no matter what it is. Sign me up, man. Um, and so as she does this experiment, the ocean feels more and more real, and her body begins to change. As, as her bones crack, her limbs separate, her eyes shift, her skin stretches, and then she starts to feel these eight mini-minds. She is, of course, becoming an octopus. And as she goes through this experience, she thinks about her own life. There's lots of kind of self-reflection. But ultimately, it's, it's the question of what would it be like to experience the world as an octopus? And the game kind of interrogates that because, you know, it could be nice. I'm not convinced it would be. <laughs> I think it would be mildly terrifying. Um, but also interesting and warming. And so um, I'm going to briefly show you a bit of the game with my over time thing going on here. Um, so you can get a sense, and I'll, I'll just talk about a, important things. By the way, this is my mom singing. She's a musician, so this is, this is her album from the 1970s? Something like that, anyway. Um, so, again, I'm really interested in sound. So the game essentially is text and audio spectrums. And so here we have a, a discussion between the professor and the subject before they start the experiment. So you have all this kind of discussion rendered, again, visually and textually. And they kind of go back and forth a bit. Um, I'm not going to ruin it. You can go play it later. <laughs> and then we get into the, the main uh, area. I just want you to listen for a minute. You're now hearing the actual sound of a coral reef. This is a recording of the crackling sound you hear, or a shrimp. That is a fish. That's another type of fish. And so I managed to get a hold of these files from a bunch of very nice marine biologists who were kind enough to send them to me. Um, but the idea is, as the player interacts with this, they hear more and more of the ocean. They interact with it, they, they experience it, but they slowly become more and more like an octopus. And as you go, as you go forward in the narrative game, the octopus eye gets more and you essentially are descending further and further into what it means to be an octopus. Um, and as you explore, so I must get to the, there we go. As you explore, you get choices. You can swim one way or another. We swim right this time, get down to this whooping sound um, near an antler coral. And again, each of these is a distinct type of animal. Um, and the, the player character is reflecting on what this means. Um, and this is kind of the main sort of way the game progresses. It's a damselfish, actually, although I'm not entirely sure what kind. <laughs> Maybe you can tell me. Um, all right, let me just get to the last sort of bit of this. Okay, um, all right, here we go. Oh, there we go, okay. And then so, because it's a textual game, I wanted to render the experience of the person textually. So instead of having a bunch of cool graphics, which I also couldn't make, because I'm not really a computer person, uh, I rendered the individual uh, tentacles as just text. Because the idea is, as the limbs are moving on their own, they're sending sensory data. It's smooth, it's rough, it's sour, it's sweet. Uh, the tentacles are able to taste the water chemically, but also essentially feel light and, uh, uh, through, through the, essentially the skin, really. And so the idea is, as the player is going on, these start moving more and more on their own, which becomes more and more, you know, to some degree, off-putting. Um, and so, for example, here we have where there's just so much going on, the character doesn't know what to do. <laughs> and so you have several choices, which I can talk more about um, later. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's enough for the preview of the game, since we're running out of time. Um, but the idea, again, is just trying to understand what it would be like, thinking about it, experiencing it, and learning from it is, is the kind of idea behind the, the narrative experience. Um, and very quick, I have like 30 seconds left? Yeah, that's Yeah, okay, all right. 
Uh, very quickly, uh, as the terrible second pitch, my next project, if I ever have time to do it, which I usually don't, is called uh, Curated Worlds. And this is going to be a novel project and a video game. Uh, so I'm working on the novel mostly right now, but the, the game is kind of in, in the beginning stages. And um, this game is essentially imagining a world in which we've developed drugs that allow you to experience any specific emotion anytime you want. Sounds great. Does it? <laughs> I'm not sure. And so part of this is the drawback, of course, like any drug, is that the more you take it, the more you need. And if you take too much of it, you're incapable of experiencing any normal emotion on its own. And then you have the kind of, so then you have uh, people who get completely addicted to it, and the rich people can stick things in their heads and be able to be like, I want joy, click, bam, joy. The poor people go to vending machines and buy a can of joy, right? And it lasts for varying time periods, depending on the person and how much they've taken. And so the um, gameplay is based on this, uh, not particularly scientific, although I think it's still used in psychology, uh, range of emotions, emotional dyads, it's called. Uh, and so the idea is that as you go on, you let's say drink a can of joy, and then your character will be in the mode of joy, and the choices you have narratively, who you can talk to, what they say back to you, will be based on the emotion that you have. Or you know, let's say you want anger, or you need anger to do something, or you can combine two of them, in this case, uh, to create curiosity. And so as the gameplay moves on, you have these kinds of elements in play. This is, a, I did the, this is really not what it look like. This is just to give you an idea. Uh, so the idea is that you'll have a kind of health bar. You'll have um, this uh, sort of EMOD gauge. So as you get more addicted, this fills up. And that has consequences for your health, but also how much you have to take to get a specific emotion. And it kind of will track the narrative as you go through. Um, so you're welcome to ask me more, more questions about that later. Sorry it was so long. Thank you very much. That's actually a good question. Um, yeah, so anything to do with sound, audio tracks like movies or music or uh, commercials, right? Use audio for a very specific purpose. Uh, for example, everything is in the minor key in a movie. It makes you sad, right? This is basic human psychology. So they do use it for good things, and there are, of course, many times you can use it for not so good things. Um, you can manipulate people's psychology to make them want to buy something. Or you can use it as uh, a form of interrogation, actually. It has been used as sound has been used as a form of interrogation, a way to break someone down. I have another question. Yes. Uh, uh, we, uh, we, we don't have time. <laughs> Sorry, but I want to have a second, second question. It's okay. After we can have yeah. more. Yes. Uh, so we know we have fragments of history. Mm. Ah, good question. Um, I know of non-human non stuff. So there's a lot of uh, databases now of non-human sounds. There's one, it's like the Ornithology Lab at Cornell or something. They have like millions of sounds of everything, like whales and dolphins and birds and stuff. Um, so they have those. As far as anthropogenic sounds, sadly, most of them are probably in a, a Foley library. So um, Foley are the ones who make music and sounds for uh, video games and movies. So you can pay and have lots of those things if you want. But as far as languages specifically, um, it would depend on the language. There, there are some for different languages. Particularly, um, there's been a lot of research on uh, endangered languages, where they will go and record communities just to kind of maintain an audio recording, at least, of small languages. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs>